I'm, I'm working into this and learning. I've also been pulled into another area, and that is chronic pain. And that overlaps with addiction. And once you see chronic pain from a polyvagal perspective, you see it as a reaction to threat as well. And you see the nervous system being in this hyper sympathetic, defensive, often mobilized state, uh, and a withdrawal of the social engagement, the facial expressivity, and the calming mechanisms. So pain becomes this unambiguous signal that our body's under threat. So then it starts all making sense. Uh, one of my colleagues on the think tank that I'm part of with on chronic pain is always talking about people giving up their anger. And I tell them, don't get to those higher levels. Their bodies are in states of threat. And that is what's going on. Giving up anger, you're angry to defend. Mm -hmm. They're just more convergent cues to inform me in my, in my intellectual model building that chronic pain is very much associated with the body being under threat. It's un unambiguous. Well, with pain, it can be uh, even more excruciating. It can be back pain. It can be any form of pain. I wanted the pain group to think in polyvagal terms. And I really was talking about three different uh, clusters of pain, cranial nerve pain, like severe trigeminal pain, mm -hmm. uh, gut pain or visceral pain, and spinal, skeletal motor, muscular pain. Now, these are, in a sense, different poly polyvagal theory tells you about what part of the autonomic nervous system is really focal with both. And so I don't know if they all follow the same rules within polyvagal theory, but I thought it was kind of interesting to see the different organizational model one could come up with. But it appears that in all three cases, there's a withdrawal of the, let's say, the social nervous system, the social engagement system, that it doesn't matter where the locus of pain is, the body's in a state of threat. Interestingly, with gut pains, which I'm actually doing research on with adolescents who have functional abdominal disorders, uh, their vagal regulation is low. And there are syndromes, and you may have heard of one, which is called Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. It's a hypermobility. It's people who are uh, double-jointed. They have a lot of anxiety. But we're finding a metric uh, through autonomic measurement, it seems to be a very good uh, a model of showing a, a, what I call a inefficiency of how the vagal break or the vagus works. So they may have vagal tone, but it's just not effectively working. And with Ehlers-Danlos, they have lots of visceral pain and somatic pain. So it, it's, it becomes a good model. And I think this metric may lead us to a better understanding of the medically unexplained symptoms like fibromyalgia, like other forms of dysautonomia. So I think the laboratory research is going to be helpful uh, to provide that psychoeducational where people can see, in a sense, the, the root or the causality of what they're experiencing. And it's not merely something in their head. And then uh, from a polyvagal informed perspective, I think certain neural exercises can be developed to rehabilitate. And these can be breathing, they can be listening, uh, they can be social interaction. Uh, they can play as a neural exercise if we respect it for what it is. Welcome to the 2021 Radical Recovery Summit presented by the Killaby Center for Recovery. This is Lynn Fraser, your moderator. This year, our theme is Feel It, Heal It a new paradigm of recovery, featuring a diverse group of thought leaders and innovators, people who are working on the ground in the new field of addiction recovery. Go to RadicalRecoverySummit.com to sign up and watch free.